long just to allow flexibility. Uh, often when patients come in or when I talk to other ENTs in the region, they ask, well, what do I do different with these complex Sampras triad, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease type patients? I say, well, I have a secret weapon, and my secret weapon is Drew Ayers. He's our allergist immunologist at the University of Washington and has dramatically improved the success rate of the work I do and the patients we take care of together. I would say 90, 95% of the patients I see with polyps also see Dr. Ayers. And there's so much interaction now that we share clinic, our clinic space on the same days and these complex patients come in. So if you don't have a relationship with your allergist or immunologist, it's critical that you do. And I know a lot of you practice otolaryngic allergy, but this is different. This is true upper, lower respiratory allergy, asthma. Um, and Drew, thank you very much. It's uh, a great teamwork, and thank you for coming. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, let me reiterate that from our aspect. We, we couldn't see the patients that we see at UW, the, the immunodeficiencies, the AERD, the severe asthmatics. And I want to echo what is... What has been said earlier, if when you guys go in and help with the upper sinuses, the, the lower airways really do follow suit. Um, so I always know when Greg and Ernie take them to the OR, it's going to be a nice month for us for, from their asthma um, aspects. But disclosures none. I do have, I am a PI on a, a compassionate use mepilib, mepilizumab study, which I'm going to talk about and was touched on earlier. It has nothing to do with this case. Um, the first case, a 42-year-old female, and we've all seen these patients, and we're seeing more and more, maybe because we're looking for them more and more. And, and the history is usually fairly classic. About five years ago, you know, before they had some mild asthma, mild rhinitis, didn't even bother them enough to take medications. Then they came down with what they thought was a viral URI, and their sinuses have never been the same. Um, they tried nasal steroids. Initially, that worked. You know, they tried everything else through the kitchen sink at them, but unfortunately, prednisone, Usually the only thing that makes them feel better. Um, imaging obviously shows sinusitis. And they go in, you guys clean them out, do a beautiful job. They feel great for a few months, and the symptoms come right back. From the asthma standpoint, these patients drive us crazy. Some do really well, but others are more of our severe asthmatics. And it's always, it's always classic to me that they're, they're, if you have FEV1 of 40 50%. They're wheezing when they walk in the room, but the first thing they want to talk about is their nose, because it drives them nuts. Um, and in further discussion, and this is something I've started asking these patients, um, does alcohol bother you? True IgE-mediated reaction to alcohol is extremely rare. I don't think I've ever seen it. But the people that come in and say, you know, I react. I have nasal symptoms, and I have some wheezing with alcohol. A lot of times, these are these patients, these AERD patients. And, um, the classic uh, triad to, to finish that out is whenever he has NSAIDs, um, he goes into immediate wheezing, nasal symptoms worsen significantly. Within about 30 minutes to three hours is the classic. So AERD, or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, you know, we have a cohort between Greg and I. We probably see 20, 30 of these patients, and I've seen three in the past few weeks. So they're coming in, I think, partly just because we're looking for them more. It's a pseudo-allergy, and you should react to all of the COX-1 inhibitors. So there's a movement to call this NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease, or NERD. Um, it doesn't have the cachet, and the group down in Scripps is pushing for this movement, but that may be called NERD in the coming years. So, so we'll... Actually, that is UNI. That's a picture last summer from, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, no, classically, it's within a half hour to three hours. And when we do these desensitizations, it's like clockwork. Usually it's within about 60 minutes. They start reacting, and it can be impressive. You know, they can drop their FEV1 50%, 60%. You know, their nasal symptoms, they can't breathe, they vomit. But once you get them through, and we supportively treat them, follow spirometry throughout, at the end of the day, when you send them home, they feel great. They feel better when they came in in the morning. I'm not going to go over the pathophysiology because it's not completely understood, but like what was touched on earlier, it's, it's an imbalance between the prostaglandins and, and leukotrienes, and it's, a lot of the, the inflammation in this disease is driven by leukotrienes, and PGE, which you inhibit when you, when you give aspirin or COX-1 inhibitor, is actually an anti-inflammatory. You take away the anti-inflammatory, shunt more of these leukotrienes, and that's the initial benefit that, or the initial worsening that these patients feel. Um, treatment of rhinosinusitis, you know, I don't have to tell you guys about that, but usually in these patients, they do respond a little better from uh, leukotriene blockade. 
you know, we usually just uh, use Singular. You can use the 5LO inhibitors, but I haven't had a, a, a much more of a success with Zyflo um, than, than the other ones, and you have to monitor the liver function. So Singular is usually what we go with. Surgical, obviously, I don't have to tell you guys about that. Asthma, we oftentimes will max these people out, and you know, still their asthma is uncontrolled, but it's their nose that drives them nuts. So as far as NSAIDs, um, if patients aren't interested in desensitization, we give them a list. Um, a high percentage of asthmatics that end up in the ICU um, are actually these patients, even though that's only you know 5% of asthmatics, just because they come down with a cold, symptoms worsen significantly, and they accidentally take an NSAID. I have a ton of my patients that have been in the ICU intubated for, for quite a while with this disorder. So patient selection. This isn't everyone that walks in the door. You need to, uh, you need to find the appropriate patients. Obviously, medical, surgical, we always try that first. If they fail that, or if they need antiplatelet drugs. We've had a lot of people with AERD that just need um, aspirin for cardioprotective reasons. So we'll often desensitize these people. And, and it, is, it is very safe when you do it co correctly. A game changer in this, or oh, I should mention this first, and this is where this collaboration, obviously Greg and I usually manage these patients medically, surgically first, but uh, coordination takes place before we do um, the aspirin desensitization procedure. We always want to debulk the polyps. There's medical polypectomy, which the group down at Scripps has not shown to be as beneficial as you guys going in and cleaning them out about two to four weeks prior. So we always have to coordinate when the surgery put, taking place and when can we get these people in for the desensitization. Um, we always want their asthma control. That's the biggest risk with these desensitizations is pushing them into uh, severe asthma exacerbations, although you know, we've never had to admit anyone in the patients we've done. The, the group down at Scripps has done over 2,000 of these, and I think they've had to uh, admit one person. But if you do it correctly, it's a very safe procedure. And, it, and the game changer has been the uh, leukotriene blockade, blockade because that blocks a lot of that lower airway inflammation. So it's much safer from an asthma aspect as far as desensitizing these people. If they're not on Singular, we start them the week before, um, and most of these patients fly right through. So again, this is mainly out of the group from Scripps. Um, there's been a lot of papers, and this has been proven to be effective, but I should point out this is not effective in nasal polyposis, asthma, if they don't have aspirin sensitivity. So you need to document aspirin sensitivity or NSAID sensitivity prior to desensitizing these folks. They looked at a group and tried to do that, and patients that didn't react to aspirin or the other NSAIDs, and it was not effective. So they have to have the classic triad to undergo this desensitization. So the studies have shown reductions in the number of sinus infections. They smell better. Um, decreased need for sinus surgery. And I know these people drive you guys nuts. You go in and do this beautiful job, and then several months later, you know, the, the sinus, sinus symptoms are back. Improvement in nasal symptom scores, so they feel much better. And interestingly, by the time they walk out of uh, these procedures, they are feeling better. Decreased hospitalizations for asthma, obviously we care a lot about that. Um, decreased use of systemic corticosteroids. Um, a lot of people come in on chronic steroids for years even. And a few of them, we've been able, been able to wean down their, their dose. And one guy had been on it for 20 years. We almost have them off corticosteroids since we've desensitized. Now, this certainly is not for everybody. If someone has a history of a GI bleed, especially if it was significant, severe gastritis, you know, that, that is a contraindication. We've actually had to take someone off in the past year of this aspirin therapy just because he did have severe um, gastritis associated with this. If they have an upcoming elective surgery, you know, we always want to make sure that's not the case. And you need to choose motivated patients. They're only desensitized as long as they're consistently taking that aspirin. So if they miss more than three days, they have to come in and do the whole procedure again. And this is the procedure. So we've taken the Scripps protocol, and we've started um, using nasal Toradol. And that's, this actually speeds up the protocol. So you slowly increase the dose of uh, nasal Toradol that you give them. And in our experience, almost all the people have started to react during this part of the protocol. The other nice thing about this protocol is that if I'm on the fence, I don't know if someone's truly reacted to NSAIDs, I'll have them in for a morning and do this Toradol challenge. And if they don't react, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to have AERD. After that, they get their uh, uh, two doses of aspirin. The first day usually takes about eight hours. 
you have to do serial spirometry, monitor them fairly closely, and almost everyone reacts the first day. My colleague has taken over the first day, and this has been wild. I'm there on the second day, and I put my feet up because there's almost no reactions at that point. Once they react, once they get beyond that threshold, they're desensitized and usually do very well. So in your patients with AERD, you know, you've, gone, you've done the surgical medical route. Consider this. I know we perform it at UW fairly regularly. I think there's someone in Bellevue, Dr. El Kayam, does this, and, and a few other people in the States. A lot of people used to have to fly down to um, Southern California to get this done. But yeah, no, we're, we're one of the centers now that do that. So let us know if you have any of these patients, because they can be very difficult. So switching gears, but sticking with the nasal polyp theme. So 39-year-old history of asthma, nasal polyp, seasonal perennial allergic rhinitis, on high-dose asthma therapy, on topical budesonide rinses, um, multiple polypectomies. You guys, again, have done a beautiful job, and unfortunately, they come right back. IgE level is 242. Um, to qualify for this medication I'm going to talk about, the IgE needs to be above 30. And they need to be sensitive to a perennial allergen. The main ones around here are dust mites, cats, dogs. Um, molds, although molds are not as big of an issue around here as they are down south. Um, and despite aggressive treatment of all these different things, and, and she, she has polyps all over it, and as was alluded to earlier, that's not going to fix nasal polyps, putting, on, um, putting them on immunotherapy. Um, also had a peripheral eosinophilia of 600, which is not uncommon, even in our asthma and uh, allergic rhinitis patients. So, this is one I presented uh, last year. It's omalizumab or Zoller, which we use a lot of, actually mainly for chronic urticaria at this point, but we do use it for asthma, and it's been around about 10 years. So this is an interesting study from a group out of Belgium, um, and they took both allergic and non-allergic patients and received just a few doses, four doses of omalizumab, and compared the two groups. Again, it's a small study, only 16 in omalizumab group and eight in the placebo. But they did show... A, improvement over that time in total nasal endoscopic polyp scores. This is backed up by CT findings, a blinded radiologist. And another thing we care about most is their airway symptoms seem to improve in this group compared to the other. Nasal congestion improved, anterior rhinorrhea, loss of smell, wheezing, dyspnea, and quality of life improves. Um, a lot of these patients, because their nasal polyps are so severe, their asthma can be so difficult to control. This is someone I would probably would have put on um, this medication anyway. So if you're seeing these patients, especially if there's an asthma component, you know, at least consider looking into Zolaire. I, they, I think Greg and I have two or three patients, and, and for the most part, they have responded. Now, this mepolizumab, I, I, this study has been out for a few years, but it's only been on investigational protocol this year uh, up till this time. Um, I have an investigational protocol for hyperacinophilic syndrome, but it's incredibly difficult to get people on that study. But mepolizumab, it's an anti-IL-5, as, as you probably know. IL-5 drives the eosinophil production. And this is an interesting study. They, again, very small, took 30 patients with nasal polyps and randomized 20 to the mepolizumab and 10 to the placebo um, and gave them two doses of mepolizumab. What I thought was interesting is they took them off all their other medications, including the nasal budesonide rinses and things of that sort. Um, so obviously the placebo go group got a lot worse, but... In 12 of the 20 patients just getting mepolizumab, they had a significant improvement in nasal polyp scores, and their CT scans were similar as well, compared to only one of 10 receiving the placebo. And also, similarly, the loss of smell, post-nasal drip, congestion all improved compared to the placebo. From what I've heard, this drug um, should be approved around September, but you never know. And this may be something in our arsenal for these nasal polyposis patients with uh, lower airway involvement that we may look into. They're going to have to meet a criteria as far as their serum IG, or excuse me, serum uh, eosinophil levels. But I think this is something we may be able to have access and may help with some of these patients as well. Third case, yeah, we, we have a lot of these patients. And I know Greg and Ernie see a lot of these patients as well. I, I think we're up to 50 or 60 uh, of these type patients in our clinic now. And Children's has another 100, 150 so 36-year-old female, recurrent sinus infections, responds initially to antibiotics, but symptoms return relatively soon. Um, did well up until several years ago. Had four or five sinus infections in a year since that time. 
But a red flag, and I always ask people with chronic sinus disease, yeah, have you ever had pneumonia? And it's not, oh, yeah, pneumonia last week. You know, no, have you had pneumonia? Or they had a chest x-ray. Did you have to get admitted to the hospital or anything of that sort? And if they have pneumonia as documented by chest x-ray, that, that piques our interest. Other weird things, yeah, Giardia diarrhea, the required treatments. So were we hiking in the woods? No, I, I just got it. No one else around me had it. Simple workup, we were able to diagnose this. This is common variable immunodeficiency, and you can diagnose this just by getting immunoglobulin levels. And that, there's actually a free kit that you guys like, can have access to with a blood spot that looks into this. So common variable immunodeficiency is the most common clinically significant immune deficiency that leads to recurrent sinus infections, pulmonary infections, et cetera. So this is a slide I got from Troy Torgerson, who's an immunologist at Children's. And it's simplistic, but this is kind of how I think about people that walk in that we're working out for immune deficiency. It's obviously much more complicated than this, but I try and put people into the different categories. Is it a problem with adaptive immune um, issues? B cells. For those of you seeing adults, this is by far and away the people that are going to walk into your clinic. Um, these patients have recurrent sinopulmonary infections, recurrent pneumonias, I always ask about sepsis, um, you know, bacterial infections involving the sinuses and lower airways. This is the classic presentation for that, and CVID is the most common in, in that regard. Now, T cells, I don't know how many of you here see kids, but um, T cell is usually a more severe um, immune deficiency that presents earlier in, li in life. Um, they classically present uh, with recurrent viral and fungal infections. They often have a lot of autoimmune disease as well. So if you're seeing people with um, recurrent sinus infections, um, recurrent rhinosinusitis that have a lot of autoimmune issues, this will raise our interest there. And the severe kids that occasionally, if you're seeing young kids, could walk into your clinic. Hopefully that's a thing of the past because we started screening for severe combined immune deficiency, at least in this state. I think California has as well. So the severe skid or bubble boy should, should not be walking into your clinic at four or five months of age. The phagocytic disease, that's classically skin abscess, internal abscess, burkholderia, aspergillus, nocardia, staph and serratia. When we see those bugs in unusual spots, that's when we start getting interested in the phagocytic disease. This presents usually in childhood, but we've caught people in their 20s, even 30s with the, with the CGD in mild cases. Then there's innate immunity, uh, the complement-mediated disease, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, um, which is thought to be rare, although we have a couple of patients at UW. Um, and if you talk to my colleague, Matt Altman, who does research in complement, he thinks it's much more common, and we're just not looking for it enough. So B-cell immunodeficiencies. Again, these by far and away the most common things that are going to walk into your, your office. Obviously, the sinus issues. Sepsis with encapsulated organisms. Um, unexplained bronchiectasis. Recurrent weird GI infections requiring antibiotic treatment. If you see that in addition to the sinus issues, that should raise a red flag. Again, CVID, most common. You can make severe case diagnosis just getting immunoglobulins, but I'm going to give you a few more tests to send away if you are at all interested. IgA deficiency. They say anywhere from 1 in 200 to 1 in 400 people have this, but most of them are walking around totally asymptomatic. Um, specific antibody deficiency, and as Greg knows, I look for this all the time. They have normal antibody levels, but the functioning is, is, is not there. So what we usually do is, is look at their response to pneumococcus, the 23 serotypes, specific IgE. Give them pneumovax, and then have them follow up in one month for repeat labs. And we can see how well they respond. And there's a gradient, but, they're, but if they're really low in their response to that pneumovax, they're at much higher risk. And they're more consistent with the CVID patients as far as their risk, not only for sinus disease, but for severe infections moving forward. I have a CVID patient that I saw last week that I've been following for a while who had, I think, 10 pneumonias that required hospitalization. HSV encephalitis has had sinus, you know, 10 sinus surgeries, um, had all of her teeth removed because of dental caries, and no one picked up immune deficiency until after all of this. Now she's on IVIG and does really well. So these people can slip through the cracks for a long time. For antibody deficiency, CBC antibodies, specific antibodies, T and B cell subsets, you can do a very thorough workup and, and rule out a lot of this. The other thing is most of the allergists, especially the young ones in this area, love doing this workup. It breaks up the rhinitis that we have to see. Um, so T cell, 
the one thing I would say there, if you ever see PCP in an otherwise immunocompetent patient without HIV, it's immunodeficiency until proven otherwise. Um, I won't go through that workup that much. It's more, much more rare. Phagocytic disease, um, internal abscesses, lymphadenitis, osteomyelitis, inflammatory bowel disease, often the, this is on our differential there. Um, again, those organisms that I talked about, the staph, serratia, nocardia. Um, absolute neutrophils and oxidative burst is an easy way to diagnose 90% like, of these people. And then complement casket. I, I apologize for throwing this at you. Um, but early complement levels, the C1 to C3, um, those are usually recurrent um, bacterial infections. But like in C3 deficiencies, over half of these patients have lupus. So autoimmune can go along with a lot of these um, so late, the late uh, portions of the cascade, the membrane attack complex. If you see recurrent Neisseria infections, that's always on the differential diagnosis as well. The nice thing about this workup is it's very easy. All you have to do is get a CH50 and test all the components of uh, the, the classical cascade. There are other rare ones like mannose binding lectin, but you know, those are extremely rare. The common ones you're going to pick up here. This is from the Im immunodeficiency website. I'm running low on time, but as you can see, we're on the front lines here. The, the two big things are recurrent ear infections, or serious sinus infections for both kids and adults. But ask about those other things, you know, pneumonias, bloodstream infections, recurrent flush, other weird viral infections. You know, if any of those are coming positive and you're having difficulty with their sinuses, um, that's something to consider. The treatment for this is IVIG, which works very well. Um, not only to help with the sinus issues, but you can prevent these recurrent uh, life-threatening infections, the sepsis, the pneumonia, um, that can be very difficult. Oftentimes, Greg and I will work with prophylactic antibiotics, uh, depending on the clinical situation. So I'm not going to go through this slide. This is you know, how I work through all these. But the other thing, and people don't know where, where collaboration can be beneficial, is we also look into drug allergies. And then it's something we're really interested in here at UW. Um, an example is penicillin, and I know it's always they call in the middle of the night, I have a sinus infection, I have a penicillin allergy, what do I use? Well, 10% of the population reports penicillin allergy, where it's probably closer to 1%, probably lower than that. We have a great test for pre-pen. It takes about an hour and a half in the office, and I'd say 98% of the time we can get penicillin off their list that can make treating these patients much easier. Now, for those of you that do a lot of inpatient uh, work, there's also other ways we can help with drug challenge procedures to see if they truly are allergic, depending on the likelihood of that drug causing a reaction, or desensitization procedures. If there's a drug you absolutely need someone on, and it's an even anaphylaxis, we can usually arrange for that to take place. So most people don't know that, know that a lot of us allergists are interested in that. But if drug allergy becomes an issue, let us know. So again, when collaboration is often helpful, Severe upper and lower airway involvement, nasal polyposis, you know, looking to aspirin desensitization, these, these monoclonal antibodies. Recurrent infections, keep your eye out. Um, Greg sent me, I think, three or four in the last year that are, that are true immunodeficiencies just from his patient population. Um, drug allergy, and again, uh, I, I don't think there's any bad time for collaboration, and I'm constantly bugging Greg about, about certain cases. And, I think he's taken one of our hyper eosinophilic patients to the OR later this week. So, no, it, it's been absolutely fantastic. And uh, thank you guys for having me. Could you comment on the dosing of the aspirin? I saw you had 3.5. Uh, I have patients who started on the strip uh, at around 650 VIV. And the importance of staying on the dose as one comment. So the first question, actually, that slide was somewhat misleading. Our last dose is always 325, but once they get beyond that dose, they're, they're not going to react. The classic area that people react to aspirin desensitization is from 60 to 80 milligrams. That's why they usually fly through that second day. So we send everyone home, just like the Scripps protocol, on 650 twice a day. Now, people come back. We usually have them back in two or three months. If they're doing really well and if they want to try going down to 325 twice a day, that's fine with me. Um, but I will usually never lower them below that threshold. But surprisingly, most of these people do very well. Um, 
in regards to the GI aspects, unless they're having symptoms, I really don't go in and have our GI folks evaluate them, and, and that's mainly coming from the data from Scripps. A lot of people do very well, um, even on these high doses, which is somewhat surprising, but certainly in patients that are having some symptoms initially, not responding to our normal therapies, I'll usually start them on a PPI, and we have a protocol that we go through. That's when we'll usually send them to the GI folks to, to have them take a look. But surprisingly, most of the patients on even these high doses do very well from a GI aspect. Well, thank you, Dr. Drew Ayers. And uh, I can honestly say that I am no longer a penicillin allergy sufferer myself. So thank you for that. It does work. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and we'll start sharp at 10, 10 Dr. Weimuller, before we break. something you can practice about uh, when you're doing the labs, and that is injuries of the orbit when you're doing the max red cross. To me, that's, that's the most common. I, I've done it, and I've certainly seen medical cases frequently. I've had that, and so doing a thorough red cross and seeing where the orbit is in relationship to that anatomy, we can do in the lab today, and we get you on a note that anatomy inside that, because it's a risk every time you do an endoscopic. And I'm just going to let Dr. Batra comment. He gave a great talk yesterday about the low writing orbit, if you want to say. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we didn't get into that actually at a case in the orbit, and perhaps we'll get an opportunity to come back to it. Um, you know, classic work done by David Parsons and Bill Bolger back in the days when they used a, a sickle knife to incise the unsnit, and they looked for flow of, of fluorescein. Um, in the, uh, you know, uh, threaded through the eye into the nose, it turned out there was actually a very high prevalence of nasal lacrimal duct injury. But when they actually looked at these patients, most of them were not symptomatic. So the reality is it does happen. It's a point that I made yesterday uh, during my talk. Uh, and I think retrograde careful dissection, looking for the natural ostium and minimizing risk of injury to the nasal lacrimal duct is, is key. And if we have an opportunity to present the case later, I did have some additional things talking about some preventative measures that one ought to be thinking about with the eye. But we'll leave that for now. All right, we will. Thank you for those comments.